Welcome to the Kim B. Davis Show. Here we'll talk to the leaders in technology, culture, business, and the arts. We'll cover politics, advocacy, motherhood, writing, mental health, and mostly we'll focus on hope. Join Kim B. Davis, author, playwright, radio personality, event consultant, professional speaker on the Kim B. Davis Show. Welcome to the Kim B. Davis Show. I'm your host, Kim B. Davis. And this evening, we have one of our favorite psychologists who's on, Dr. Angela Celeste May. She is a forensic, clinical, and psychologist. <laughs> Did I mess up? Organizational. That's right. <laughs> Organizational psychologist. I was all ready for it. Good evening, Dr. Good. Angela. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Thank you. I'm blessed and thriving. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank Wonderful. You. Blessed to be here. Thank you for being here. It, you know, it is Thanksgiving. And so yes. we are all grateful. But I want to talk about COVID anxiety and anxiety and depression and the overindulgence and food that sometimes happens at this time of year. So we know, and we've been talking about this all year. It feels like we've only been here, I think eight or nine months, but it feels like five years. 2020 yeah. has been that bad penny that just won't stop popping up. Yeah, We've had COVID, shutdowns, anxiety around that. We have a new diagnosis called COVID depression that's all about um, dealing with the virus and the shutdowns mm -hmm. and the pandemic that um, all the things that surround that. We mm -hmm. have had the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. We cannot stop saying their names. Absolutely. 100, Absolutely. 64 people have been lost to police violence. Mm -hmm. 200,000 plus people have been lost to COVID. We are coming up after a hotly contested election that has just polarized our nation. Mm -hmm. And here we are in a second way. And <laughs> yes. it's holiday time. And so the one thing that we all, all wanna do is be social and go sit at grandma's house or mama's house or whoever it is. Yes. And hang out and for a day eat well and enjoy <laughs> yes. each other's company. And what did the CDC say? <laughs> Stay home. Don't go out That's with right. other people. Yeah. Keep your mask yeah. on, keep using the hand sanitizer, but don't go around people. So then yeah. you're like, okay, wait, I got to stay at home. These are the same people I've been around all year. I can't get no people. <clears throat> and so yes. here, here we have families who, you know, have to celebrate differently because you can't have extended families. Then you yeah. have people who are single or who don't have children and it's just them and they, you know, have to figure out how to celebrate. I've heard from a lot of people who say, you know what, this has been a banner year and I don't mean that in a good way. So mm -hmm. guess what? I'm going to do everything I want to do. I'm going to have the cheesecake. I'm going to have the chocolate. I'm going to have the wine. I'm going to have all kinds of things. And we are just going to party like rock stars. But isn't that considered overindulgence? Because if you're eating so many unhealthy things, which I hear a lot of people doing, and a lot of drinking, it does make things difficult um, for you health-wise. What would you advise someone to do to um, counteract some of the overindulgence because they're trying to ease their sadness, mm -hmm. their anxiety, their fear, their loneliness, whatever it may be? Hmm. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's something that we all sort of wrestle with, you know, in an ongoing manner. Um, while there aren't like maybe one size fits all answer to that, I, I definitely think that there are a few things that um, most of us could benefit from when it comes to that. Um, the first is and we know that health experts uh, say this as well, of course. I shouldn't say as well, I'm a health expert, but in terms of physical nutritionist, I should say, um, especially at, these, uh, at a holiday time or special times of the year, uh, we should indulge. You know, there, we, we want to have balance, but we also want to allow ourselves those treats. A lot of those treats 
um, they're wonderful for many reasons. They're wonderful because um, they, they are, it's called comfort food for a reason. <laughs> so we should indulge in some of that. We should enjoy. Um, it's evocative. You know, it reminds us of growing up. It reminds us of, of family times, like you said. Um, foods have so many meanings for us, regardless of the culture that you're in. So it, it actually is important um, to have some of that, you know, to have those cheesecakes and everything. Um, and especially, especially, um, we know that when you're mourning, you're going through bereavement, you're going through difficult times, how important are food rituals, you know, with celebrations like weddings, but also what do we do when, when we lose someone, when there's a funeral, when you, what, when you want to comfort someone who's had a loss, you bring food, you bring that basket, you know. So um, first thing I would say is, as a reminder to all of us, food is not bad. There's not necessarily any bad food unless it's a straight poison or something that of course you're allergic to, of course. But food in and of itself is not bad. It's the abuse of it <laughs> and how we use it. So number one, we should, we should allow ourselves to indulge and enjoy. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing, which of course is what you're getting to is um, as far as not overdoing it and uh, doing it to the point where it can harm us. So um, for people, like you said, uh, who say, you know, it's been such a year, I'm going to have, I'm just going to indulge and have, you know, the cake and everything, you know, do have some, but, but have some, but maybe have a slice of that pie and have a scoop of that ice cream and enjoy that glass of wine and, and, and take your time to enjoy it. Eat as the French do. I mean, just, just linger and taste every taste, take in the aroma, just, just enjoy it. But you notice I said, have that scoop of ice cream and maybe even a second one and have that pie, slice of pie. I said, slice, <laughs> not have that pie. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that can like, you know, put a damper on it is it are, are the butts. You know, because it feels, we, we feel so confined, especially with all we've been going through, like you said. Mm -hmm. What people are really saying is, not only am I going to enjoy, we enjoy at holiday times anyway. That's, you know, hopefully that's a part of, that's that's what held it. Holidays are going to help us celebrate each other, celebrate the season. So we do that anyway. But what people are really saying, what's behind that for many people when they say, I'm just going to enjoy, what they mean is, I am going to take the holds off. I am tired of being restricted. I'm going to take that mask off and get that fork. <laughs> so that, that, so we enjoy anyway. But yeah, that's what it really means. So I would say number one, do enjoy. But a way, a way to help make sure that you enjoy in a way that's not going to hurt you. Enjoy in a way that's not going to harm you. I, I think that's a, a softer way to put it that's easier for people to take rather than to say enjoy but because see when soon you say but people feel oh you're confining me again so let's put it this way enjoy in a way that won't hurt you which means you know that if you have a glass of wine and then a second glass of wine that that second one might be more than you usually would have okay so indulge maybe maybe have a little more a little more than you normally would but if you have the whole bottle it's hard to do it at the time but keep in mind what happens to you when that happens how uh, how do you feel later i'm not a drinker I, so i to be totally honest you know a uh, full disclosure i'm not a drinker I, so i have never drunk a bottle of wine but i've heard tell that hanger hangovers are not fun um, you know, you can, you can hurt yourself. You can create headaches, literal headaches, you know, so slow, enjoy, have maybe a little more than you usually would, but remember not to harm yourself, not to create, uh, think of overdoing as, um, something that could hurt later, you know, that could be uncomfortable. So enjoy it. I recommend slowing down really, and nutritionists say it as well, of course, really pay attention to what's on your plate, take your time. Number two, number one, slow down. Mm -hmm. No, number one, have it. Number two, have a little more. Number three, slowly. 
really enjoy. And then three and four go hand in hand. And number four is don't beware of, don't do it mindlessly. You know, we all do that. You're, you're binge watching Netflix. You're not able to be with family perhaps this time. Maybe you are, like you said, single and alone. Put on that Netflix and get that gown. I have a good time. So you're mindless, you know, and you're like, oh, it's just so much funner. But there are, but remember, there are consequences. So beware of my, you know, the mindlessness. I would say um, if if you try to be responsible and you have a serving of ice cream in front of the Netflix, it's Thanksgiving weekend. Have a second one, you know, have a good time, but, but then, you know, scoop it out and put it back and then enjoy. Um, so have some, have a little more, <laughs> take it, do so slowly, really enjoy it. Beware of mindless eating. Um, and then also a, a friend of mine, uh, she's a, a social worker and her saying is uh, something I definitely live by, but she, the way she puts it, she says, ask the why. Like, you know, why, W-H-Y-S, ask the whys. And I think that's really important too. It goes together with the mindlessness of it. Um, and that, that is important. Well, why am I eating this? And, and, you know, sometimes we ask ourselves the why question, like, why am I eating this? Or why am I eating so much of it rather? Um, we're, well, sometimes we're very honest with ourselves because I'm sick and tired. <laughs> I feel lonely and alone. <laughs> And because I can, <laughs> and it tastes good. So yes, yes, answer the question of your, you know, ask yourself the question, answer honestly, which a lot of times we do, but then, but then, comma, when you say the wise, um, step back and again, that idea of self-care, you know what, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and enjoy this and it's going to be wonderful, but I, I want to be using words like careful, mm -hmm. not hurting myself. Uh, out, you know, not doing it to the point where I'm just going to feel awful later. So um, I, I, I think that uh, all of those help a lot with not overindulging. Um, and I'll say this too, it's important to do a lot of that, to think it through before, like today's Wednesday. <laughs> when the sun comes up on Thanksgiving and the game is on, there it is. <laughs> exactly. So um, on Wednesday or before, you know, okay, so let's back up. So a lot of times we all know this. We know this. I know I know this. You know how you're, it's, all, it's always like when you had that last part or you're getting down to the last part and then you're like, why did I over it? Never before. Never on, never pulling this stuff out the fridge, <laughs> out the oven. Um, so I think that what a lot of people are doing, especially, well, we do it anyway. Holidays coming and we 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 like plan for what we go. Ooh, I can't wait to have that pie. I can't wait to, you know. So we kind of we're planning for it, right? Which is nothing wrong with that. But I also would say would say plan for like, okay, what, what's my limit? And, and again, language is important. It, it is a limit, but then the, again, at a time like this, it, people are feeling like I can't take another limit. So think of it as care. You know, okay, uh, at what point do I need, like, how, you know, how much, don't think psychologically, perhaps instead of use the word limit, um, how much should I have mm -hmm. instead of where should I stop? How much should I have uh, before I start feeling sick? You know, how much, kind of plan for that before you you head into, into the day. <laughs> so <laughs> those are the first things I'd say. Those are the first things I'd say. Um, there is also, of course, the sort of, uh, you know, in my profession, we have what we call the primary and the secondary diagnosis, um, where, for example, let's say a person, because some of this that we're talking about has to do with addictive behavior. It's not all celebration, as we know, and it's not even all uh, just in these particular circumstances. For some of us, there, there's been a history of, of eating as an addictive thing, uh, whether it's this time, whether it's this time of year or whether it's 2020 or COVID or not, you know, and uh, what's going on right now just kind of compounds that struggle that may already be there for a lot of people. So I would say that we have to be mindful of that also. Um, so getting back to that kind of ask the whys a little bit, um, 
uh, the, the primary, like it was take someone for perhaps who's struggling with uh, alcoholism, just as an example. So the primary, uh, you know, uh, the initial, for initial, initial diagnosis or perhaps why they came for seek to seek help might be because um, they've developed an addict, you know, an addiction to alcohol or they're having, you know, having trouble with, you know, kind of putting that down. But once you get into that therapeutic relationship and start to talk with the person, you know, you begin to find as they reveal their story, that that might be secondary. And perhaps they develop the drinking problem in response to other issues going on in their lives or other painful, you know, painful uh, circumstances. Um, so that, and that can be the same with, with food. It can be, you know, humans, we have a great ability to just, we can get addicted to anything, <laughs> you know, anything at all. Uh, but food, it has its own particular challenge, I think, because, um, Unlike alcohol, for most people, we you have to you we have to eat like we have to eat to live. So um, I, I think food can present its own special kind of like um, ditches to navigate and potholes to navigate. Um, I know some things I've learned. Like I, I I'm a historical emotional eater. I'll be totally honest. Um, uh, I'm, I'm much healthier about that now, but I've had to do like my own personal work as well as working with other people. You know, you learn a lot from, from helping others as well. Um, and and I, I've done a lot of that asking. Now, why am I, what is this really, you know, trying to really dig and get under that, um, those reasons. And they differ for different people. Um, for myself, uh, it, it, and this is often the case for a lot of people. For myself, I realized it really, it really wasn't food so much as, uh, and this sounds familiar to people who, um, it, frankly, for someone who may overindulge or overeat, often can be the same reasoning, you know, underneath it all as someone who is, uh, has an eating disorder, like anorexia, who is not eating. For, for some people, um, if they can, if they feel that um, there are too many areas of life that they're not able to control. Now, for me, it, it wasn't like not feeling con that I wasn't able to control, but it became my go-to for, a, like for a lot of people, anxiety. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, there's a certain type of nervousness. I'll tell you, for me as a professional performer, the getting ready to go on stage nervousness, I can eat nothing. It just, I can't eat nothing. <laughs> I can't eat nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's that kind. But uh, like for other times, you know, anxiety. Um, and, and the thing that surprised me was it was, um, if I'm, I'm upset, like, you know, and what surprised me about it is I can understand that for someone who feels they don't have a voice. You know, I know a lot of people will sort of subvert those emotions into the food that becomes a very common thing. Um, for me, I was rather surprised as I like, you know, asked myself questions and really prayerfully looked at this because one of the things I used to say is, you know, but, but I do express, you know, I do express, um, but, but some of that was like, I, I am, I tend to be very vocal with my family, you know, and share what, you know, I'm, I'm not, I am not built this way. I am not one of these that, yes, yes, everything's fine. I can't, I can't do it. I, I, <laughs> I have to be real. I just know everything's fine. Here's why. <laughs> so because I'm, you know, because I tend to, to try to you know, emote and I share and all that, um, I was surprised at how much of some of my sometimes emotional eating was you know, anger, uh, you know, though that particular emotion. But I realized that it wasn't the having the emotion so much as uh, feeling or, or even feeling that I couldn't express it. It was more so the frustration of, yes, I'm expressing it, but I can't seem to make any changes in this area. I'm frustrated about, you know, so let's, so let's go eat about it. <laughs> so, um, so I know from personal experience, definitely. Uh, and what I have found, what I, and it becomes a habit, I will say that it just, you know, it just becomes a habit. So it can be so quickly. What I have found, and the first step can be, it can be like such a challenge because we tend to be so focused on the thing, you know, the, you know, but it's drinking, I have a problem with, but it's eating. But actually I found that if I, if I uh, deal with the emotion, for me, everybody's different. For me, the food part will take care of itself. So I had to, you know, they can work in tandem, all, you know, people come at it different ways. For me and for other people I've, you know, talked to, um, those questions about, okay, 
going back to ask the whys. Um, well, let me pause here. I think that's one of the hardest things, that first step of making space between that immediate reaction of nervousness or upset and reaching for the, you know, <laughs> to carve that space to say, well, let me pause a moment. Um, it, it, takes, it takes some work. It takes some work. It takes some practice. Uh, but starting to do that and say, well, now, wait a minute, because before you know it, you know, it's you're chewing before you. Okay. <laughs> so to, to try to car to pause before you start chewing, um, I, I think is such a key part of the work of beginning to kind of like put a stop to in overindulging, you know, eating, drink, whatever it is, um, and to replace dealing with them with, with, with whatever the emotion is. So um, I think at this time of year, with like you said, all that's in general, for a lot of people, the holidays can be challenging, of course. Um, for many people now, like you said, with COVID and all that's gone on, the things that we normally lean on or had leaned on, including humans, feel it feels like that too is being taken away, just like you were, you know, mm -hmm. describing. Um, it, I, I think it's even more, it can be even more challenging to uh, work on, uh, not challenging to work on it, but ch it can be even more challenging to, to want to <laughs> find other alternatives because the food um, and drink, things like that, they're, we feel like we can control it. I can have as much or as little as I want. Nobody's going to put a mask on my food. You know, you can't have this. This is the one, this is the, this is the area that I can control since you're taking everything away that, you know, that frustration mm -hmm. and it's instant, you know, that instant gratification. So there, it, it, there's a lot of, there are a lot of reasons it's particularly <laughs> tempting. So what I would say for people who are indulging or having difficulty with overindulging and, and using food in that way is it's similar to getting ready for Thanksgiving, similar to what I said about today is Wednesday. Um, Practice some of this stuff before the moment. You know, make it a, a work on that daily, that daily practice so that when, I don't say if, so that when those mm -hmm. stressors come up, because they, you know, it's part of life. Um, we'll stumble a few times, you'll still do that a few times, you know, but 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 it, uh, working on it before gives us a chance to start putting things into practice, start to recognizing things a little bit sooner. But we just have to just start. You know, start and like the cigarette, well, the cigarette ad said, don't quit quitting. <laughs> so as an example, let's say you're going into the kitchen. You're feeling pretty good. You know, it's not, you're not, this is, these are not the anxious times. These are, you know, these times as an example of when you, you know, you feel pretty good. You're going to eat, you know, like a normal person, <laughs> like a healthy person. I shouldn't say normal, like a healthy person, psychologically, you know, that emotionally, whatever. Uh, and you, you don't feel an overwhelming need to like overdo. You just got those, some of those are the times to practice when you're not feeling that anxiety. It gives you a chance to, to like literally sort of like build the muscle memory of reaching for food mindfully. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, think about it, actually put it into practice when you're not feeling stressed, when you're not overly anxious. So that when those time, anxious times do come up, you, it, it just, you're, you're practicing. So it kind of triggers that muscle memory. Like I said, we'll mess up again, you know, we'll get, but little, it's little by little. Um, and all of that requires honesty, you know, mm -hmm. being, being, being honest with ourselves. It can be so frustrating because we can ask ourselves these questions. We think we have the answer and then, they, well, why did I do it again? Um, so don't quit quitting because there are more answers. You know, we're, even if we don't see it, we are growing. Just keep, just keep working at, at that when, when it's indulging or overindulging for, you know, I hate to say the wrong reasons, but um, for the wrong reasons, <laughs> you know, to use that to fix what's going on with me mentally, it, it can't fix it. Because after you're done with that deliciousness, it's still there. Yeah. So we need to develop coping mechanisms that are, that are less harmful to ourselves. That was a great explanation for that. So I wanna go back to a couple of things. So okay. one, I have an addiction to pop. I love sugary soda. I am here to tell you, I was doing really well because I would only indulge in them when I went out either for a meeting or for dinner. And that wasn't that mm -hmm. often. Mm -hmm. Pandemic came. 
We need some oh, yeah. in this house. <laughs> what is yes. my because I like to do, uh, I like to mix cranberry juice or some other juice with pop. Next mm. thing you know, it was cases and cases and we just drinking and drinking. And you start to think, okay, why am I just reaching? Have I had some water today? I know I had my coffee, but have mm -hmm. I had some water today? Okay, wait, let's go back and let's think about it. So it, it is very easy to get addicted yeah. to any type of food because a lot Absolutely. of times- we get caught up in this mindset because the medical profession, which includes you, says, you don't put me in it. <laughs> are, you, are you a savory person or are you all about sweet? And so, you know, I'm a savory person, which means I like salty snacks. I love potato chips. Potato chips, the same thing. If they're in the house, I'm looking at them. Oh, I hear them talking to me like, come on, I'm on a bag. Have you had Sorry. your chips today? And then the next thing you know, I'm like, wait, I've had three little bags of chips today. Okay, wait, I need to stop. So yes, again, yes. being mindful about what you're eating. But I'll Absolutely. tell you, one of the times when I realized that I use food as a coping mechanism was when I was first getting into nonprofit and would be stressed out because my boss wanted something and I was like, it's not possible, but we were tasked to do it. You did not have a voice. So what will we do? Girl, let's go go get us some good lunch. So then right, you right. go and you eat something really um, heavy. Mm -hmm. You come back to work, you're tired. Maybe you had a glass of wine. Maybe you didn't. I often did. Yes, you mm -hmm. can get uh, drunk off of a bottle of wine. But I have a rule. <laughs> I have a rule. When you drink, whether it's wine or general al alcohol, whether it's vodka or whatever it is, always eat. They do say that. Yeah. You're drinking. It is much better. I also love the fact that you referenced the French way of eating. I was just talking to a friend of mine and yes. she was like, Kim, in France, you know, lunch could be four, five, six hours. It just, yeah. It yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it, it's not, you're not eating fast. You, you know, they're bringing your food to you, but you're encouraged to really enjoy our food. And I think Absolutely. in America, we don't do that because no. we've gotten so caught up in the, I gotta be back to work in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I look at my children who are in school who have a certain amount of time and they're scarfing their food down. And so mm -hmm. we do have to get back to the point where we really sit down, take Absolutely. a bite, chew mm -hmm. it really well, feel and taste every sensation that comes from whatever it is that we're eating that's and right. you want. because if you really did that you would eat less um yeah. but going back to uh when i learned that i was using food as a coping mechanism <clears throat> i was doing that every time and it, it wouldn't matter wherever i was going it could be a pop mm -hmm. it could be chips it could be a candy bar it could be i need a, a cheeseburger with everything <laughs> on it I need an omelet. Yeah, I'm telling all my life. I need okay. an omelet. You're not the only one. You are not the only one. Right. You are but, not the only one. <laughs> you know, because some people are like, I need mashed potatoes and gravy. I said, I understand. I said, sometimes you do need that comfort food to mm -hmm. help you feel better. But I do think it's important that we really begin to think about what we're eating. Because although we're still in COVID, lots of people are gaining weight. And when you gain weight, there are incidences or increases of heart disease, diabetes, Absolutely. high blood pressure, Absolutely. other obesity related diseases. And then mm -hmm. we know that they have said that one of the underlying threats to any person um, getting COVID is being obese. And I was just going to say that. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's so true. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I, 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 um, I remember, um, I'm a very youthful person. I always have been, but I'm also a little old lady. <laughs> a little old lady about certain, you know. Yeah, we're little yeah. Old, old lady. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I under, I had a lot of wisdom about certain things at a young age, mm -hmm. and I remember, um, as an example, and I think this is su such a, a a good way to like start and and to make changes. Um, I remember being 19. And I, you know, okay, I come from the family of carnivores. This is, I don't care what's on the plate, where the meat. <laughs> it's 
that's so my hard. Like, these are your people. These are your people. These are your people. Where is where my, my, my sons will look at me. I, you know, we'll do like a grilled chicken salad or like a shrimp salad. And my sons will, my oldest son who says he's allergic to salad. That's his story. And he <laughs> he's sticking he'll to it. Like, right? He'll be like, I'm allergic to salad because there's no meat here. I'm like, but it's right there. <clears throat> he's like, mommy. Can't that's that. not enough meat i need no. some meat that's my family <laughs> yes that's my family too. <laughs> that's, that's how i grew up that's how I grew up. so but but my my grandma and i my child grandma, we were always the bread people you know it's it's it's, it's about bread. bread the bread is bread. good bread, especially about the bread hot and it comes out the oven oh butter and microwave yes the oven. take a moment let's take a moment <laughs> <laughs> so and i uh bread. <laughs> yeah, all right, all that. So, um, I mean, I grew up, I grew up eating, you know, broad variety, you know, pork chops, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but even when I was little, some things I ate more in, uh, in terms of meat and stuff. And as I got like more into a teenager, uh, I, I just found I, I just found it less appetizing to like chew on somebody's leg. I just, <laughs> I just, I just, it was like not turning me off. <laughs> it was just like, no, you know. So, uh, I, I, I kind of like right around 19, I semi sort of became a, a vegetarian kind of, um, and for the most part, uh, for the most, really most of my adult life, pretty much all my adult life, I, I may have read me once or twice a year, you know, like a, you know, um, but it, it's not something I miss like that. Cause like I said, I was never a big meat eater anyway. And I remember when I started that at 19, um, I was like, you know what? I don't have to force myself. <laughs> I'm not excited. You know? um, and I remember thinking about, you know, eat, you know, try to eat even healthier. Cause we had a, I grew up with, you know, dinner was pretty, you know, we always had water in the refrigerator. We didn't have a lot of pop. Uh, it was always, you know, three meals a day and a little dessert. The, it was always fruit as snacks mostly or healthy little cookies. So it was a pretty good, healthy diet. Um, but I remember at 19, I wanted to, you know, get a little even healthier. And I remember I said I was gonna um, uh, cut back on salt a bit. That's what it was. I was gonna cut back on salt and and like be more vegetarian. I made a conscious decision. And I remember thinking, um, you know what? I want to just take baby steps. I'll just take one thing and then like one or two things and just take my time to make that a, a part of just until it feels like a habit, mm -hmm. and then add something else, kind of thing. Um, and I, I think that's very a, a very wise way to approach as well because. Um, we know that habits can be very powerful. Mm -hmm. And even though <clears throat> you were talking about being, you know, savory, even, even though, you know, they say those spaces, those places on the tongue where you taste the bitter, you taste the sweet. Um, even though we may be born with certain tendency toward, you know, sugar or more toward beyond that, so much of the way we eat is, is habit. It's cultural. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you go to another culture and like, mm, have some worms. <laughs> Like, well, how can you eat that? It's, 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 you're raised with it. It becomes, you know, so I know I've, for myself, I've done this and I've helped this, helped other folks a little bit with this as well. I don't claim to be a licensed nutritionist, but uh, I am one of those people that go, people call up, you know, I need, you know, give me some, some holistic advice on, you know, healing this or eating that. Cause it's, I, cause my brother and I are like that. We just love researching that stuff. Um, I have I have done for myself and helped others just take those baby steps, take one or two things and just, you know, just just work on that until it becomes a part of you. Because it can also seem overwhelming. OK, I want you to change all the ways that you eat. <laughs> Where do you start? So let's take your your pop as, as a perfect example. Well, there's a couple of things that I, I know I've done that's helped me. Um, I haven't been a big pop person, but for the you know, the things that I have been, you know, mm -hmm loaves of bread and carry it on <laughs> while we're sharing <laughs> i know that um a couple of things in terms of baby steps one is is um substitutes but substitute with stuff that you like that's that i think that's part of the issue when we want to encourage people to eat healthier or to uh be careful about overindulging and you know emotional eating you know there is that sort of concept of okay now i've got to gnaw some rice cakes <laughs> dry rice cakes can be lovely you know as a but you know that that idea so I, I and i'm not the only one who says this but i always say you know choose stuff you like otherwise you're not gonna stick to it That's so right. um if you're a kid like my husband big big sweet tooth 
they never saw a sugar cube brother did <laughs> come home so uh he, he fortunately he likes fruit as well okay. so uh, you know so we we keep fresh fruit around the house and so there's you know there's less of the candy stuff there's more of the fruit with uh pop um because because he likes pop also sparkling water mm-hmm. you know sometimes you know the I like the Pellegrino. I think that's what it is. I like, that's my preference, but you know, this is the limited. So it, it's, it's an experiment. Like instead of feeling like changing what I eat or what I enjoy feels like not changing, but I'm being confined. It, think of it as exploring. Mm-hmm. Let me explore some other stuff that may, you know, that may be healthier than I like. Let me, let me try some different stuff. So I think that's a, that that's a nice little baby step of the idea of let me try some other things and find and find out what I like that I could substitute with and then have the show enough pop like you said for your for your you know what your alcohol rule you know drinking alcohol you know have it sometimes but maybe substitute like like sparkling water or whatever you find that you know that as a nice substitute that might work for you and then on Friday and Saturday have the pop or something you know Mm -hmm. Just play mm-hmm. around with that. Different things work with different people. Um, the other thing is, I, I know you've heard this because I've heard it, having it in the house. Yes. I am also the cookie monster. I am the cookie monster. <laughs> they fashioned that moment after me. That's all I, <laughs> that's all I know. <laughs> so I have, cookie. it's about a cookie. It's for a cookie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I have, I have literally, because my, um, uh, my husband does the bulk of the grocery shopping around here. And he brings us some healthy stuff, organic stuff, you know, healthy stuff, whatever. But he also, you know, brings in those, those, some of those cookies. So I have, I have actually, I have asked him on occasion, could you please <laughs> save it to Friday? We'll enjoy it's Friday and Saturday, whatever. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of like my rule. I, I pretty much try to, you know, what is the 80, 20 rule, you know, mm-hmm. Monday through Friday, you know, keep it on the healthier tip, eat clean, as they say, you know, mm-hmm. fresh fruits, all that good stuff. But again, still stuff I like. There is some, uh, what are those chunks? Not chopped, what do they call it? But the chunk, a watermelon chunks in the refrigerator right now. Oh, I love those. There's not a candy in the world that could touch. Yeah, not. Nice. Some watermelon. No. Or a peach. Come on. Green, <laughs> a plum, pineapple. Hello. Yes, yes. Yes. So that's what I'm saying. I'm saying, you know, those things that, oh, you know, they don't feel like you're in prison, <laughs> prison somewhere. Find the stuff that you that you really, really like, love and enjoy. Have that. And let the, the cookies and the pop and stuff, you know, have it sometimes. Let that be Friday. Now, I have made this mistake in the past where, you know, where the weekend was Friday or Saturday, and then it became Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh- <laughs> and then there's a little bit of Monday morning. <laughs> So I, then it's so, Wednesday. You know, so then it's Wednesday, Wednesday, right? Wednesday. <laughs> and you have a reason for like every day. Oh, yeah. you know, oh, that was a grueling a meeting on Tuesday. So I got this. Uh, uh, and then on Wednesday. <laughs> and then it's back know? to Friday, and it's been like every day, and you just like exactly. You know, I, 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 I can't help it. <laughs> yes. So it's, I, you know, it's an ongoing work. It's not baby steps, but like take one thing maybe and work with that a little bit. And then when that becomes a, you know, after it, what do they say? It takes like three weeks. Yeah. Roughly to develop, you know, build or break a a habit. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of all, don't beat up on ourselves. You know, know that we're going to like, I don't, I hate to say mess up, but know that we're going to like, you know, overdo or whatever. And just, just keep going and, and look at what we've learned and explore, you know, what's some other stuff I could enjoy that, that maybe I haven't tried, you know, Mm -hmm. that I might. I really, really like so so there's there's all of that <clears throat> and then of course all of that's tied to the thinking habit mm-hmm. habits you know the way we think we we have same thing we have habits in terms of the way we think <clears throat> and to that end I would like to read a passage yes please <laughs> <laughs> I want to read a passage so from my book freedom what is the experience of living without negative self-imposed limitations uh, I changed the name, uh, as, as you do with research, I changed the names of the people I interviewed <clears throat> when I shared their stories and they talked about, and I, sh- I shared their stories of getting being stuck in some way on their journey to being free, whether it was 
uh, addictive behavior or in their careers, self-esteem issues, all of that. Um, <clears throat> and this particular young man, I called him David. Mm -hmm. He was he was talking about that. Uh, this is in his own voice, uh, you know, his words. And he's talking about um, uh, his habit of thinking that he didn't realize was um, limiting, like a negative self-imposed limitation. So he said, um, oh, I'll read, starting from my narration, almost every person who gave a definition of the words negative self-imposed limitations, because that's part of the title, stated that parents or families were either the originators or significant contributors of this way of living. This is on page 67 <laughs> at the top. Words like quote unquote learned behavior and quote, influence of parents or family, <clears throat> end quote, were ways of defining where it is that we first begin to limit ourselves. So it's a learned behavior. People say it, they may model it. You just kind of see it around you. And before you know it, we take it in because we know kids are sponges. <clears throat> so David, he put it like this. This is all, these are all his words, quote. How do I define this? I think for me, they were a learned pattern of behavior that was influenced by my parents, particularly my parents' relationship with each other as I grew up. It's learned behavior, it's a negative behavior which comes out of my mother's negativity that self-imposed it, he said that self-imposed it on my person. So if she was, if she tended to look at things and I'm more of a, oh, that's not gonna work out. Oh, you know, it's negative. You know, as, our, as kids do, we take that in and we don't even realize we're taking it in. Mm -hmm. Well, he finished up by saying, and not knowing and not having the ability <clears throat> uh, because of the age that I was um, and because it was something that I grew up around, it was all around him, he couldn't, he couldn't see it clearly at the time and therefore he didn't know how to untangle himself from it. Mm -hmm. So he, he very directly said, looking back on it, he knew growing up his, his mom could tend to have a more negative perspective on things in the world, but he didn't realize until uh, he was older and looked, I mean, at this time, I think he was in his 20s, young, young man, mid 20s, that he was looking back on it and saying, you know what, I just, I lived in that. That was the lived environment. So that means, you know, you're breathing it, you're eating it, you know, and it just infused the way he not only saw the world, but the way he saw himself. Mm -hmm. I think that too is directly related to uh, overindulging for like emotional eating also. If we tend to, see ourselves as or, or situations as things that we cannot affect like I was mentioning earlier frustrated that I can't make a difference or I can't seem to move this thing the tendency uh, can be the human tendency can be to put our attention on what I well what can I control and that is often food and you know food and drink um, and, and at this time you know the year of COVID and all the other you know the Breonna Taylors and all that those are certainly uh, feelings that uh, things that have occurred and are continuing to happen that make us feel helpless. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say I would interject into that into that thinking that um, even in the most helpless of circumstances, we we still have, uh, as the Bible says, we have we have choice. We yeah. still have choice, and that choice is so 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 powerful. We have a choice of how we. Uh, think about ourselves, about what we do, uh, all of that stuff. So I can't, well, I, well, all things are possible. So I'm not going to say can't. I, I was going to say, I started to say, you know, maybe I can't stop another officer from uh, killing a black or brown person in the next five minutes. Then again, prayer is powerful. Maybe I can, but I was going to say, what I was going to say is over time, as we continue to, to pray about that, you know, protest that, push for law change, all those things, um, the frustration is not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, perhaps, but the the taking of, you know, feeling like we have some say, some control, some power comes in, you know, the uh, the day-to-day -day work to make a change with that in whatever little and big ways that we can. If you can contribute $5 to an organization that's fighting that for Black Lives Matter or whatever the case, you know, whatever it is, uh, it all makes a difference. Um, so I, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways, one of the biggest lessons from this whole conversation I would say today going into Thanksgiving and, and beyond is you are, you are never as powerless as you think you are. And I think the perfect example of that 
the perfect example of that is when we talk about a person who is enslaved mm -hmm. body everything you know womb all of it in like you are an enslaved person but nobody can enslave your mind that's right you know we have to allow that so mm -hmm. so yeah so um, so much of eating is about again feeling helpless feeling i don't have a choice feeling the food controls me <laughs> or whatever the case we we always we always have choice and that's a we're more powerful than we think and that is a great way to end that segment we are powerful i have one yes. more question for you dr angela okay how should people who cannot visit or who are choosing not to visit with their families handle mm -hmm. that anxiety just a generalized anxiety you know maybe they want to see their parents but they're afraid to because of of COVID and they're following mm -hmm. instructions and then of course you have the flip side where you have families who are like dude COVID been here all this time it's gonna be here just come on over and hang out and you're like eh, I don't know if I want to I you know I'm nervous about it How? And, and then people start to have anxiety but I think that goes back to what you just said about having choice yes uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say to the the first part of what you were saying, um, for those who are not spending that, you know, who are social distancing from their loved ones, um, you know, uh, we the technology helps, you know, definitely if you can, you know, see each other. Uh, but we have to keep in mind also, we, we talk about this in terms of education and how everyone doesn't necessarily have access to internet and stuff. We also, I think, take for granted that we can do this. You know, everybody can't do this e e either. Um, if you if you can, if you have that on the cell phone or whatever, that definitely can help. But you know, I think for those who are cho choosing not to be there, there are a few things I think that are so therapeutic and and really uh, help with the joy of this time. One is what do I what do we learn from our elders and our old folks? who for them have lost so many of their contemporaries, perhaps they, you know, their, their parents aren't here anymore. There's something so lovely and comforting about that reminiscing. Remember, blah, blah, remember that, remember that Christmas when you, and you know, the laughter, the, uh, the ability to still share mm -hmm. can still be there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's important <clears throat> to still share, whether it's just a regular phone conversation, if you can't see each other, if you can't see each other with the, you know, the technology, um, uh, looking at photos, like looking at old photos and just really, it, 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 again, we have choice. Looking at those photos can contribute to a good cry, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> that could be part, part of it. But it also can contribute to joy and laughter and, and remembering and oh my gosh, you know, I remember, you know, even if you're by yourself, just like take some time. Uh, and that can be a self-love thing too. And something else also that it's an old art. It's an old art form, but way back in the old and prehistoric days, remember people wrote letters? Yes. <laughs> remember that? <laughs> way I still write letters. That is a, I tell you, for someone with like kids and stuff, yeah, who, who for whom that may be foreign, I don't know, <laughs> sit down and write grandma a letter, mm -hmm. you know, share what's, what's been going on or whatever the case. Um, if, if you're alone, you know, you can make a project out of that. Other things, um, we, we can send things, the mail be, may, mail may be a little slow, but you can, you know, send a little something, things like that, there are ways to still share. Mm -hmm. And, and enjoy the joy of the time. Um, you know, my grandmother used to say, uh, you know, I think I've mentioned before, it's impossible to be depressed and thankful at the same time. Just take that, the, the tears may come, that's all part of the whole lived experience, but to be I'm so thankful for the times that you had and, and plan, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, you know, like the Dr. Fauci's and our, our professor, you know, like they're saying, and like people are encouraging us to do, you may not be able to be together right now. And I'm, I, I for one, I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I'm gonna give some support to Governor Whitmer. I'm sorry, in the state of Michigan, Amen. sister, trying to save a life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank for you. The in, save for the people in the, in the people in the back. In the back. <laughs> How dare she try to save you and your family? So right. I won't say. Um, but as as people like our leader, you know, our public leaders tell us, 
you know, I know it's not easy right now, but just look for, think about what it'll be next year when you, when you know that, you know, you have helped to perhaps help those loved ones be there next time. So plan, look forward to when you do get to see each other, what would you like to do? What project we go work on? You know, start to knit that sweater or whatever, write those, letters. still do things that connect you. Um, and for those, and to your last part of your question, to those who um, are like, come on, <laughs> ah, come on anyway. I think it's a great opportunity to model behavior without being preachy. So <laughs> um, some may find it harder than others, especially when you have your, your elders or people you look up to saying, you know, you know, come on over here. Um, you know, you put it, put it in your own words, however you might say it, but I think it's a great opportunity, opportunity to say something like, um, you know, you know, I, I would love to see you, but I'm not going to, I'm not even going to risk jeopardizing you like that. I there love you. you too much. I'm not going to bring that over there. I don't know what I might have because <laughs> you can have with no symptoms, asymptomatic, you know, you, I, I love you so much. I miss you, but I'm not going to risk, bring, risk, use that word. I'm not going to risk bringing that over to you. I care about you too much. That's right. I love you. I'm not going to do that. Love you though. <laughs> <laughs> so all of that, all of that. <laughs> See, this is why I had to bring this topic to you, Dr. Angela, because you just answered all my questions and gave I'm us glad. so much to <laughs> think about from mindful eating to yes. modeling good behavior. So yes. I messed up in the beginning. So I, I, I got it right now. Oh. So, <laughs> forensic, clinical, organizational psychologist. Yes. And you are an author and a musician. <laughs> Tell us about your book that you read from, where we can find it, and then talk to us about your music. Okay, thank you for asking. As you always do, I appreciate it. My book was uh, my book was my master's thesis. I do have a doctorate, as she said. Um, I have quite, you know, I, I I had to think about this myself. I'm like, you know, what? I, I've done a lot in terms of the area of diversity as a psychologist, and my doctorate degree, uh, my dissertation dealt with diversity issues as well. So that that's another passion of mine. Uh, but this is was my master's thesis, and. Uh, a lot of my classmates were writing uh, master's thesis and research about, um, you know, a, a variety of things, but I particularly wanted to write something about resilience. So this book, Freedom, Freedom, What is the Experience of Living Without Negative Self-Imposed Limitations, is a, a research that I did. I interviewed a small handful of people from a variety of backgrounds, a range of ages, uh, uh, different ethnic backgrounds, <clears throat> men and women, to find out, um, uh, to, to interview them, to get their stories about how they found themselves perhaps stuck in different ways in their lives. I purposely left it open-ended so that it could be relationship. Self, uh, Self-esteem was a theme that ran through many of their stories, uh, but stuck in some way in their lives and how they were able to you know, navigate and evolve and grow to the point of feeling that they were free of living without negative self-imposed limitations. Now, that doesn't mean at no time, you know, at no place in their lives are they feeling limited, but that they learn some tools along the way to help them feel more free. And um, what came out of the research were seven themes. There are seven themes um, in the book that basically that they all had in common, some, some key things that helped uh, that we all can learn from, I would say, as far as how we can evolve from feeling stuck in some way to feeling free from that. So that is this book, and you can get it at Amazon. Uh, it is available in, uh, this is a paperback, it's available in hardcover, and it's also an ebook. So yes, you can get, you, you can get that. Um, uh, oh, music. Okay. <laughs> I'm a professional <laughs> a musician. I'm a professional vocalist. I have a bachelor's degree in voice performance. Um, I have a private studio. I've been teaching uh, music for lots of years. Um, and I have a company called Celeste Productions Incorporated. And under my production company, under that umbrella, I teach. Um, I am recently in the Marygrove College Conservancy campus, formerly Marygrove College campus, um, teaching there as well. Um, I am a recording artist. I'm a producer, writer, all those wonderful good things. Um, I sang at, uh, I made my Carnegie Hall debut in 2017. I've been blessed to be on the stages in Russia and, and uh, Ireland, et cetera. Um, 
So right now it, you can see uh, some of my official music videos, um, last three, four that I have done. Um, I always produce them and I co-direct them with my filmmakers and all that stuff. You can see them on my YouTube at Angela Celeste May. Simple, <laughs> you can see them there. Uh, you can go to Reverb Nation to, to like look at a lot of photos of my performances and kind of keep updated on what's going on. And um, oh, and my albums, my two albums, um, No Limits. You see that there's a theme, freedom, no limits, <laughs> no limits. Um, and also uh, reintroducing the lady. That's the, the latest album. So you can um, uh, go to iTunes, Amazon for those, as well as ReverbNation.com slash Angela Celeste May. Um, upcoming for me, I'm going to be I'm finishing with working with my filmmaker to release uh, uh, my latest music video. Uh, with the whole election season, this is the most involved I've ever been directly in an election. So I kind of got a little behind on, on my uh, edits and things that, to send to my filmmaker, but I finally got that done. So we hopefully will be releasing my latest music, music video. And it's, um, as, as with most of my work, I do lots of covers in live performance, et cetera, but my recorded work has primarily been original songs that I write. Um, and uh, people find my music very unusual, <laughs> which I love because the multiple genres, they cross genres. They always have strong, um, encouraging lyrics. And this particular video that's coming up, if you go, if you, uh, find my look at my album it's the word uh, it's the song um listen up with an exclamation mark and i wrote that as an open letter to young people i wrote it a few years ago actually i performed it a few times with my my band um but when it came time to recording it for the actual album i wanted to hear young voices on it so i'll give you a little a little hint a little secret just between me and you <laughs> and all who listen right um and all who listen um it's with DYC, which is Detroit Youth Choir. Yeah. So yeah. So I was uh, uh, I met Anthony White, the the conductor, the director, when he was still an undergrad student at Mary Grove, and I was teaching in the music department, and we've been friends down through the years, and I've been a board member of DYC for a number of years, and um, every now and then he called me, Dr. May, would you come do some coaching? So I vocal, I have done vocal coaching with the kids, you know, just through the years. So just before they blew up, became super famous. Um, a couple of years before that, I, ha I had the, I gave them their first experience in the studio. And so I, uh, they are on that album with me. And um, I'm very excited um, about finally doing this, this music video with them. So that's what I'm working on between me, you, and, and all your wonderful people, uh, fans who watch you. Uh, so I'm excited. So hopefully that'll be released with, uh, it'll be released soon. It'll say, I'll, I'll say a few weeks, you know, that, but, but before the year is out for sure. For sure. Okay. okay. So that's what's coming up. Fantastic. Look at all the wonderful things that are going on in your world. So I've got to ask you one last important question. Yes. What are you grateful for? Oh my goodness. Where do you start? <laughs> where, where do I start? Um, golly. Oh gosh. I'm so blessed. I don't know. Everything. <laughs> Everything. I, I am. I am grateful. Um, well, first of all, I'm grateful for my life. Amen. I'm grateful for my life. I mean, not just having a life, but grateful for. Um, you know, every time I do, I, I work out like five, four times, four to five times a week, and then try to do some extra walking and stuff. Um, and every time I complete a workout, I say thank you, Jesus. You know, I'm thankful that I'm healthy to be able to exercise, and and have the mind to do so. I'm thankful that I can do the kinds of work and creative and just you know everything I do. I'm blessed. Uh, to do the things that I love, all of it, the writing, recording, I'll just, uh, you know, I do things that I love. Um, I'm so thankful for my family, for the way I was raised, for my relationships. Just golly. <laughs> it's just, it's just, I mean, when I say everything, um, the Lord works in mysterious ways. So even the most difficult, challenging, even painful uh, occasions that have occurred in my life, you know, just down through the years, as they say, they all brought me to where I am today. They all made me stronger. And I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm just spoiled. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> I'm just spoiled and loved and blessed to be so loved and, and to be able to give that back or try to. Um, golly, it's just, and, 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 and the eve of Thanksgiving, I get to be on. Kimberly. 
<laughs> Bachelor, <laughs> Davidson show. This is like this is like the bowl. It's the bowl <laughs> on top of all the other. I'm just blessed. It's it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's well, wonderful. I wanted to say thank you for being on the Kim B. Davis show, for blessing us with all the information and knowledge and enthusiasm and hope and optimism that you have brought in discussing some of these very serious uh, topics that people are struggling with. So I thank you. I look forward to December, our our next topic and 2021. I'm going to claim it. 2021 is going to be better. Yes, it is. (laughs) Yes, and I would say let's take as as we run away from twenty twenty, <laughs> but let's take the things we learned. Yes. Let's take the you know the the ways that they built it's built us. Let's mm-hmm. take the things we are new you know reminded to be appreciative of mm-hmm. as we go as we go into twenty twenty. Absolutely, absolutely. So tell us, Doctor Angela, how we can reach you. You didn't tell us that last part. Oh, um, how can you reach me? You can reach me. Uh, at well, the two you could just you can email me for sure. Uh, you can reach me at um amayassociates.com, and that is the uh, website for my counseling, consulting, and coaching company that I have with my sister Michelle May. Um, you can also you can email me at Celeste, that's C E L E S T E, my middle name, and then M U S, which is short for music. So Celeste M U S on the number one at aol.com. Um, so yeah, you can always shoot me an email and, um, uh, or you can send me a message on, uh, Reverb Nation as well. Uh, oh, and also Facebook. I mean, I'm on Facebook, all of that, <laughs> Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, every, everything is like everything, but Twitter is just Angela Celeste May, Angela Celeste May. <laughs> so, so there's no question. Angela Celeste May. So I'm on Facebook, uh, Dr. Angela Celeste May is my professional Facebook page. Angela Celeste May is YouTube. Um, same with Reverb Nation and Twitter. Uh, not that you reach me through Twitter, but you can follow. Feel free to follow me on Twitter, and that's uh, Celeste M U S M the number one Twitter. But yeah, awesome. all those ways. Awesome. Thank you, Doctor Angela Thank you. Celeste May. Thank for you. On. Happy Thanksgiving. I wish you and your family a great. Thank Thanksgiving. you. Hopefully, and you also. Awesome. Thank you. Hopefully, you can just chill out and have fun and not have to answer your yes. phone. <laughs> Yes. I know people I'm looking call for you me. like, Dr. Angela, <laughs> I need some help. I need some coaching. You can like call me on I'll Friday. get back to you right away. I'll get back to you. <laughs> Be all right. That's right. That's right. But thank you um, for being on the show today. Thank you everyone for watching the Kim B. Davis show. We hope to see you on our next episode. And as always, remember, be magnificent. Stop.